Uh, thank you, uh, Rob. Um, well, hello. Uh, I'm Andrew Sheng, Distinguished Fellow at the Asia Global Institute, University of Hong Kong. Welcome to INET Live Climate Debates. This session will discuss uh, the elephants in the room. How will US-China climate relations play out? This is a very exciting topic in the run-up to COP26 in Glasgow next month. Uh, sorry, in, uh, uh, in, in, in November. Uh, and joining us today are Andre Marcou, founder and executive director of the European Roundtable on Climate Change and Sustainable Transition, uh, as well as uh, Kevin Tu, senior advisor on China to Agora Anagevende. Uh, welcome, both of you. Uh, let's start by uh, asking uh, Andre to give his views on the, uh, you know, the climate debate. Uh, particularly the role of uh, U.S.-China relations. Andre? Andrew, thank you very much, and thank you for the invitation. This is a one heck of a, of a topic, and, and it is indeed the elephant in the room. The elephant in the room is nothing else because of the size of the economies of the world, but also in terms of the, uh, the emissions that they, they, they contribute. Uh, EU is done now slip to under 10%, the, uh, together, uh, these uh, these two giant economic giants account for about 40 percent of emissions or somewhere thereabouts so that is not a minor but also uh, the geopolitics in this keep changing and that is not an indifferent when it comes to climate uh, climate is we all may agree on what to do with the climate we have everybody would agree to save the planet the question is which when i was ceo of aida I had a board member, a Brazilian, who said there's an 11th commandment who pays the bill. And, and, in, the end, and in the end, there is this matter, this little matter of, of the energy matrix and, and how this energy matrix affects development, how this, that energy matrix affects uh, competitiveness of, of the country. Now, there have been different, you know, I'm not, gonna, I'm not the, the greatest China hand, my former boss, uh, my former boss and mentor, Mori Strong, and had lived in China and had taught me a few things about China. So I, I come from that school of thought. But all I know is that there have been, at least in the climate development, there's been different stages. Some of them been more indifferent, some of them more adversarial, some of them been more cooperative. Clearly, uh, in Copenhagen, where we had tried to replicate the Kyoto Protocol, and, 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 and go down the same pattern. There hasn't been the greatest cooperation. But then the Paris Agreement was really made, you know, as they say on PBS, made possible by a, a great entente and cooperation between the US and China. The EU has played an important role, of course, but there's no denying that China EU, uh, China US cooperation has played a, a key role. I, you know, I, I'm, I'm not in that category. But I, you know, one could not uh, miss on the on the floor the uh, the the, the uh, if you're the chemistry and the dynamics between the U.S. and the lead U.S. and and and, and Chinese negotiator. Now, also as you have mentioned, the when when the U.S. pulled out of, of the Paris Agreement, China did play a constructive role together with Canada and the EU to keep this uh, this going. And they have been quite successful. You know, everybody has taken the lead. But uh, there are a number of, of things that really come into play now. And this is from the EU point of view. Uh, I will look at a, number, a few things. At least, you know, I'm not speaking for the EU. I'm not speaking for the Commission. I'm speaking for a think tank in Brussels. But I would look at it from a number of, 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 of you. First of all, uh, carbon markets have played an important role. In, in getting China involved. The Clean Development Mechanism has had China, some people call it the, the China Development Mechanism because China was at an overwhelming presence in that, in that market. But it also created that, that problem from people thinking this was a great idea until they figure out that somebody, uh, European companies were paying their competitors in the chemical industry and other industries in China for, uh, for offsets. Uh, that were then, then used to compete with them. So that be, that did create some some resentment, and we can still see that every time you bring up the CDM in in the EU, that that's a problem. And I don't think it's divorced from that. 
The second part of it is this, uh, this Paris Agreement and the promise of the Paris Agreement, which we regard as asymmetric because we're all brothers, but everybody's moving at their own speed according to the nationally determined contribution. So we look at the Americans, we look at the Chinese, and we say, great, they are promising all kinds of things, but they're promising sometime in the future. But you know, as I said, in the long term, we're all dead. So before we get the long term, we got to get in the 20s and early 30s. And in this case, competitiveness and carbon leakage becomes an important point. So a, 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 a significant goalpost is the carbon border adjustment mechanism, the border carbon adjustment that the EU is proposing to introduce. Now, that's an inter interesting concept. It has tried to introduce it before through international aviation, and it had to withdraw from that, basically, in the face of international pressure. But nevertheless, now it is seem quite determined. The theory that we hold is that the EU, in the end, is going to be very hard pressed to do this alone. It's going to have to find cooperation with one of two out of three. At the minimum, three out of three is best, but two out of three is a necessity. So, with it, you know, but we've seen China being fairly negative. I mean, the reaction from China has been very strong and very negative. It's saying this is uh, environmental protectionist and this is not the right approach. And we've seen the US also taking the same approach. So, so far, this has been, this has not been uh, a very successful uh, in, uh, if you want, in, in attracting support, but it is a cornerstone of the EU policy, allowing it to go to 55% in 2030 and then rapidly toward carbon neutrality. The second piece that is interesting is the last piece that's left of the Paris Agreement or the Paris Agreement rulebook, which is the, the Article 6 rulebook which is carbon markets or, or international cooperation, including carbon markets. It, it's quite interesting in there and, and looking at the, the, dynam, the dynamics because nobody can figure out why these guys can reach an agreement. You know, some people blame Brazil, other people blame, I don't know, EU, EU intransigence. And we're looking at it. I, if I were to look at the dynamic between the EU, China and, and, and the US, I think the EU takes a very intransigent view. I mean, they really would like to have something really, really, really very, very, how should I put it, very, very strict. I see the, the US being more pragmatic and, and having, you know, it, it's the American pragmatist, Yankee Doodle, and so on, they're much more pragmatic in how they approach this. And we see China taking a very interesting position in some cases, in some cases, basically going into a G77 group, and in some cases taking an LMDC group, like-minded group of, of countries. So it's quite an interesting dynamic. And, and I think that in the end, you know, when, when China and the US will fall, in, if you want, align themselves, and the trio between US, China, and, 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 and the EU will manage to get their, their, their position a little bit more synchronized, that is going to be telling and will be able to move this agenda. We see the announcement that was made uh, at the United Nations by, by the president of China, which is very promising. So we think that the EU is really, uh, has bet quite a lot on maintaining a good relation and a climate diplomacy relation with China and the US. We look at, at the EU having put a lot of resources in cooperation with China on, 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 on climate change. The US, it's been in, it's been out, it's been seen a little bit now, it's quite positive, but a bit more of a stable, if you want, relationship when it comes to climate change, if you look at the period of the last 15 years. That would be kind of a view from, from here, but it is driven by cooperation, Andrew, but it's also driven by the harsh reality that climate change and how we address climate change and the speed with which we address climate change has an impact on the economic future of this continent. Thank you very much, uh, Andre. That's very helpful. Uh, if I may very quickly sum up, you see that actually EU playing a very crucial role in the relations between you know us and china uh and so the three-party relationship uh you know on how the outcome of this will shape uh the you know the the the, the future of the cop 26. uh this is very good indeed uh uh well uh i'm going to invite kevin but unfortunately he's lost his connection 
Uh, Kevin, are you there? No, we have an unstable connection at the moment for Kevin. Uh, but let me, um, uh, Andre, while so we're waiting for Kevin to, to, to join, uh, Andre, the, the, the issue as I see it, the joke always was when in, in Asia that when elephants fight, uh, the grass gets trampled but they also get trampled when the elephants make love. I mean, uh, so the smaller economies are really caught by all this. And so uh, are you fundamentally positive about COP26? Or, uh, you, know, the, you know, do you feel that uh, things are, you know, uh, may end up with, you know, more of the same as it were? Andrew, it is a, a difficult question because it is a difficult question moment look in many cases even in the corporate sector they're all very good friends and all wanted to move forward on climate change but now they got down to brass tacks and they're really in the in a you know realize this competition and substitution and so on so yes there is love but at some point you realize that life is, is getting very real i think the same thing happens in 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 uh in glasgow i think that we are now getting beyond the rhetoric and we see the harsh reality of what this means. You know, it doesn't mean that one has to be negative to be realistic and we see what it means. I mean, it means it will mean, uh, it, you know, it's not a hundred percent this, but it is, the, you know, it is high energy prices in the EU right now. I mean, if there's anything that gets people's blood up right now is, you know, I don't know they'd want to talk about football, but they talk about what they're going to pay for, for electricity. Now, carbon is not the only part. It is portion of that. There's dynamics in the other energy commodities, but it's something that people, people in, in everyday life will attribute to that. So there's a diff, it's a difficult environment, and that is compounded in a very serious way by the negotiating uh, circumstances or the discussion circumstances there are people which are usually huddling with each other and I don't know patting each other on the back are going to be told to sit a meter and a half apart from each other which is I think is utterly unrealistic and if you know the negotiator so I think that uh, I think it's a difficult environment I I don't know what the percentages are the only thing that I do know is that we had a good success in in uh, in Paris because we had a good presidency. And, you know, Minister Fabius and, and the French presidency had done a very good job. I mean, I, I can't say enough uh, good things about how well they did. And UK diplomacy is it's something that they've been doing now for a few hundred years. Uh, and I have great hopes that the UK diplomacy is going to be able to, as they say in Canada, stick handle this whole thing through not an easy environment. Good. Uh, Kevin, uh, can you switch on your mic, please? Uh, your turn uh, to, to, to say a few words on your view on, uh, you know, where the U.S.-China relations are going. Oh, okay. Uh, before I talked about uh, U.S.-China relations, I would like to talk about uh, the Chinese uh, energy economies in general. Uh, against the backdrop of a global pandemic, uh, Chinese economy actually grew by 2.3% year over year in 2020. Because of this discrepancy, China's share of global carbon emissions increased from about 29% in 2019 to 31% last year. Uh, so, uh, this number alone explains why it's important for China to be part of global energy transition and also net zero emissions agenda. However, uh, whenever we look at uh, climate policy in China, we need to uh, examine where China is nowadays because from the perspective of many advanced economy, it's very difficult to consider China as a typical developing country for various reasons, such as the size of the economy, 
the second largest one in the world, the size of the energy sector, the largest one uh, in the world. However, if we look at uh, many um, per capita indicators, especially energy access to one, China still has uh, near 400 million people who don't have access to clean cooking fuel. So that's not what we expect to witness in a typical advanced economy. So that's why I personally categorize China as the first ever hybrid superpower in the modern era. Uh, in other words, China sits right in the middle of the developing country block and uh, the developed country block. Uh, this is very important to understand China's climate uh, policy. For instance, back in uh, September 2020, Chinese President Xi Jinping pledged to peak China's national carbon emissions before 2030 and then achieve carbon neutrality before 2060. Uh, this uh, 30, 60 pledge could entirely be explained by China's hybrid superpower status. If we look at uh, the Chinese decision makers, they grew up in a year uh, the country is a is a real uh, developing country, so they do have the so-called developing country mentality. So that's why it's very difficult for China to directly commit to uh, a climate neutrality pledge as an OECD countries. So the country needs ten years of buffer time um, to peak its national carbon emissions. However, if we look at what will happen in 10 years, China will become um, high-income countries according to World Bank standard. And the newer generation leadership will have more superpower mentality. So that's why um, by 2060, uh, China will achieve carbon neutrality. So uh, we need to remember China is a hybrid economy sitting right in the middle uh, between developing country and advanced economy. Then I would like to touch upon um, the EU CBM. If we look at the EU CBM from the perspective of European Union, it makes sense because uh, the bloc has the highest carbon pricing uh, in the entire world, more than 50 euros per ton of carbon dioxide emissions. If you look at other parts of the world, if you keep its carbon pricing uh, higher and higher, then the so-called carbon leakage will become inevitable. However, if you look at the perspective from China, China actually is in a rather difficult position. On the one hand, the country still considers itself as a developing country which is difficult to be accepted by either EU or United States. But on the other hand, if we look at what, what will be down the road, uh, China has already kicked off its own national carbon emission trading scheme. Although the current carbon pricing level is not very high, but uh, sooner or later, it will mimic the trajectory of other advanced economy. Then, if we look at uh, the surrounding regions, um, none of them uh, could easily uh, commit to uh, either climate neutrality or net zero emissions targets. Uh, we are talking about those developing countries such as uh, uh, India or Vietnam. Then sooner or later, China will also face the so-called carbon leakage threat. If China want to keep uh, a significant portion of its manufacturing capacity, sooner or later the country needs to work with the European Union uh, on a global carbon pricing package. Uh, the last issue I would like to point out, which is actually related to US-China relations. Um, um, 
September uh, 22nd, actually, Chinese President Xi Jinping uh, just pledged to stop finance of overseas greenfield coal-fired power plants. This is actually a quite big news for the international community. However, it's quite interesting to observe, again, China made such a big commitment without uh, uh, making any political concession from counterparts uh, such as European Union or United States. If we look at what happened during the Obama era, the willingness uh, for China to work with the United States to conclude Paris Agreement actually has led to a bad overall US-China relations. But this is not the case nowadays. Uh, China has made uh, several major uh, political concessions in the climate front without uh, any um, thing in return uh, in area of US-China uh, relations. Of course, on the one hand, this reflects the increasingly complicated US-China relations. But on the other hand, uh, I, I don't believe uh, this uh, situation is sustainable if US-China relations keep deteriorating over time. I'm not entirely sure there will be enough momentum to uh, sustain uh, all the climate efforts voluntarily made by China until now. I will just stop here. For some reason, they un 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 muted me. Um, the the issue now is that uh, the, the the basic U.S. China difference, as I see it, is that the Chinese want a total package, uh, whereas the Americans prefer an a la carte cooperation on climate change and containment and competition on everything else, right? Which is which is not going to be easy to negotiate, right? So. So that's where the big picture is. Uh, uh, I am pleased to, to hear that uh, President Biden uh, uh, say uh, in the United Nations that there will be no Cold War. Uh, uh, and, you know, hopefully that is the case. Uh, uh, but uh, uh, obviously, if there were areas of agreement uh, in COP26 between US and China, and particularly uh, the EU playing a very important role, uh, sort of moderating role, as it were, uh, then you'll be a way, you know, a very, a very good way forward. But as as you know, uh, as Kevin, you you said, the China is both a, is a hybrid country. It's, it's parts of it is very advanced income, and parts of it is very very backward still. And so you take somebody like India. Uh, India's position is uh, quite hardline in the sense hardline in the sense which is, you know to be fair to India. Uh, if they were to be able to meet all these conditions, uh, you know, their GDP would be actually quite hurt from the conventional perspective. So uh, how do you see the, the, the negotiations, these elephants, coping with the newer uh, uh, emerging elephants or the emerging market dealing with this situation? Uh, Andre, maybe you would you know, have a crack at it since you've negotiated on behalf of uh, emerging markets. Well, my, again, this is, uh, Andrew, you're getting into, into higher politics here to some degree, but I would give you my, my two cents, my observation. My observation is that in general, China is trying to, uh, is trying to stay within, within alliances in the, in the climate change. I'm, I will not comment about other areas of the world, but when I see China, uh, I see China being very solidarity and being very careful to be uh, not to break G77 solidarity and also to uh, to uh, look at other groups that it's being part of uh, with the major developing countries with the LNDCs. So it is it is getting into a number of of, of these alliances uh, and and not being in a in a position to uh, to, to to go alone at it. That is that's my impression. Uh, I think that it's it's really has been uh, to some degree in certain areas kind of the, the, a strong voice 
uh, in other areas it has come in and and sometimes being a stronger voice like in in uh, in in market in article 6 it has been a stronger voice sometimes it's been a, a, you know a more muted a more muted voice it has a certain points that would like to uh, like to tactically support because I think it it is again in this, this coalition on issues like border carbon adjustments for instance which is the only issue that you see uh, the only place where you see this in the UNFCCC is it's a very esoteric copy called response measures it, it's a very political thing uh, China is is it's a strong voice it's one of the leaders of the G77 when you see them getting together so my sense is that uh, China is playing a, a strong a, in a, a, and will be a very strong voice in, in, in Glasgow. Uh, I would, you know, where it will fall on these issues, I think you referred to uh, this a la carte, which I, you know, I've also, uh, in a way, independently also read this in other places, but this a la carte approach, whether, uh, you know, this is acceptable to the People's Republic of China, it's something that is, as we know, it is. They will do what is the interest of China, uh, and at this time, my my sense is that the EU is playing, wants to play the role of being the champion. So the EU is going to run up the up up the the, the 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 hill with the flag, and then look behind and see, you know, where the, this this duo of the uh, US and China are having a powwow and discussing, you know, how we're going to do this, guys and then make a decision whether they follow up or not. And, and I think the EU is going to be difficult to, to move this alone. I mean, 10% of the global emissions, even with a very big market, in my view, is very difficult to move the world. So they will always have to look over the shoulder and see if these two other giants are following. I'm not sure, I'm not sure what, what the view is from Beijing, Kevin, but that's how, the way I would see it. Uh, Kevin, uh, maybe would you like to respond to that? So I would like to share a few uh, of my own thoughts on this issue. So first, if we look at uh, the prospect of reaching Paris Agreement goal, we really need international collaborations. When we talk about international collaborations, we are talking about not only uh, advanced economies such as the US and the EU. We are not only talking about the emerging economies such as China. We are also talking about those uh, developing countries with re rising carbon emissions, such as the India and the ASEAN countries. Uh, so that's why um, uh, we need to uh, find a way to really uh, to encourage uh, all those uh, countries, all those economic blocks to work with each other instead of undermining each other on some key issues and hopefully uh, wishing um, those countries and blocks to work on a single uh, political issues, uh, in this case, climate change. So if we look at uh, uh, the mentality of decision makers in China, there's a rising anxiety about China's uh, uh, climate pledge. The reason is quite simple. Because of China's quite unique political system, uh, whatever has been pledged by Chinese president, it needs to be observed by not only the current uh, administration, but also the administration after the current one, maybe also the next one after the next one. However, if we look at the track record uh, in certain uh, Western countries, uh, they have um, made a U-turn on not only Paris Agreement and uh, uh, also Kyoto Protocol. So. This is where the anxiety of Chinese decision makers come from. Uh, because once China make a commitment, uh, then the government is expected and needed to deliver uh, in the end. 
uh, so far, China's track record uh, to meet international climate uh, commitment have been uh, relatively good. So, so that's why we we need to understand uh, this type of mentality of uh, Chinese uh, decision makers. Uh, and uh, uh, in this regard, uh, if EU could find a way uh, to encourage or even pressurize uh, e, uh, China and the United States to work not only on climate change, but also on some other quite pressing ones, such as uh, the pandemic control, it's a shame. Uh, the, the largest economy in the world cannot even work together um, on pandemic control. Uh, this is a, a real shame. So, so that's why, uh, although climate change is very important, we, we shouldn't forget there are many other pricing issues. Uh, you should uh, encourage US and China work together instead of undermining each other. Uh, through such approach, uh, if US and China could be either encouraged or to be pressurized by the international community to work on more and more um, pricing issues um, with global interest in mind, uh, then the world could become a better place. Yeah, well, uh, basically what the, you, both of you are saying is that the trust issue is very critical, okay? I mean, it's, it's not just trust between the three of them, but also trust with the rest of the world. I mean, you know, how do we, how do we, de how do we deliver what we promise uh, and, and, and then not, not uh, 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 upset the, the trust factor be between all? There's a, there's a very good question that's come out, uh, and I think this is more addressed to, uh, I mean, both of you, I guess, um, which impulses do you expect from the new German administration for COP26? Which is a good one, because, you know, the Germans, the German coalition con comprises a lot of Greens. Andre, why don't you start? It's a, <laughs> it's, a, uh, it's a difficult question because the German coalition, could, the German government can fall into quite a few coalitions and they can be quite different to some degree yes you can argue that there is there's a bunching on environmental and climate issues but i think that there could be quite quite a difference between you know depending on the on the on the uh composition of, of the government i would i would think that the the government the, uh, the german government is not at least to my understanding is not enamored with the idea of an adjustment at the border so it's going to be uh, a carbon adjustment at the water being so dependent on exports and neither is the BDI. Again, speaking for myself, I don't speak for them. But uh, I think that is going to have an impact on, uh, on, on EU policy uh, because the, the, I think the, 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 the need to reach other type of accommodation and other type of cooperation as opposed to adjustment at the border is going to be an important thing. So my expectation is that a, a, a very green German coalition is going to push hard to reach out to both the US and China to ensure that the result in Glasgow is important to them because the last thing they want is they want to get into a trade war. You know, this, this border adjustment is, nobody quite knows how this is gonna end up. This is like, like the old man, the mutual assured destruction, and nobody knows if you unveil the weapon, whether or you build a weapon that you hope you never use. So my expectation is that a a, 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 a strong German coalition with strong environment with strong environmental leanings, they will all have environmental leaning, but with stronger environmental leaning is gonna push very hard for a uh, for a good result in, 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 in Glasgow. That's very good. Kevin? Any views? Uh, so if we uh, examine uh, the different uh, options of a coalition government after the forthcoming German elections, uh, there is probably 70 to 80 percent of the chance uh, the Green Party will be part of the next German government. Um, 
However, um, if we look at uh, uh, whether there is a um, comprehensive uh, climate strategy that has already been formulated uh, by... Oh, I'm sorry, he, he, we, we lost, uh, sorry. Um, yeah, we got, got Kevin back, carry on. Uh, we seem to have lost Kevin in terms of voice. I'm sorry, it's a connection issue. Uh, that way. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Kevin, can you hear us? No, we seem to have uh, lost connection. Uh, Andre, whilst we're waiting for Kevin to come back on, let me ask you your views on whether we will get the fulfillment of the 100 billion climate fund in COP26. I'm sure we'll get it. It depends how you count it. <laughs> I mean, That's a good one. You always you can always get to, to a number. It depends, it depends what you count in and what you count out. I right. think that, you know, uh, the sense I have is that uh, there is going to be I'm not sure it's going to be 100, but I think there's going to be a real, a real progress towards that, that number. I think that uh, the developed world, uh, having gone through this crisis of, of COVID and, and made substantial outlays of money to, uh, to maintain, uh, to support the economy, uh, now getting into a situation where there's significant amounts of money being also dedicated to climate change, to the transition, both in the U in, in Europe and in the U.S., that is less less clear, but it's it's, it's certainly the, the bill is there, and, and that there is a desire on the part of administration. The only the only thing that is a little bit confusing, if you want, in the signal, it is Europe confuses us a little bit, is the fact that. You know, there's been pressure on the part of many, including ourselves, if you wish, to uh, for some of the funds that are being, uh, if you want, uh, a port taken through the uh, adjustment at the border or what proposed adjustment at the border, to also be made available for international purposes. And whether that would be to the green climate funds or as a mechanism, but it could be counted toward that 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 commitment. So we would like to see some of the uh, the money, especially through this uh, through this uh, uh, measures that impact other countries, uh, to be dedicated to uh, mitigation in and adaptation in, in developing world, especially even though the SIDS and even the SIDS and the LDCs are not included. So that's a little bit slightly contradictory. But the, you know the, the American administration has uh, made it quite clear they're prepared to contribute. They haven't made clear the, the numbers. The EU is uh, is always kind of game and there's contributed substantial amount. So I think we're going to get closer to that number. I don't you know I, I'm sure that somebody is going to count a hundred billion if they want to, but certainly the direction of walk of, of travel is going to be in, in, you know on the up. Uh, Kevin, uh, you may need to switch on your mic because I think it's off at the moment. Uh, yeah. oh, okay. So uh, if you want to finish, if not, we were talking about whether what are the chances of getting the 100 billion uh, climate fund uh, on the road. So uh, I will talk quickly about uh, EU CBAM. Uh, no matter... Um, which coalition uh, government will be formulated in Germany after the forthcoming uh, election uh, is quite important uh, to deal with uh, uh, the EU CBM discussion at the EU level because the uh, EU CBM is just like a nuclear weapon in international climate politics. It's in any major economy's right to design to formulate uh, this uh, uh, weapon of mass destruction. But uh, everyone should be extremely careful to actually utilize such an uh, instrument because the uh, devil is always in detail. Uh, if uh, it's not appropriately handled, um, UCBM could turn out uh, to be a catalyst 
for another round of Vukanova trade war. So that's why the next um, German coalition government should be extremely careful about um, um, EU CBN related agenda. Yeah, regarding the 100 billion uh, US dollar um, commitment, um, because I I have attended uh, many um, Beijing based di discussion, uh, no one really uh, takes it too seriously. Uh, first of all, it's not uh, uh, from a public uh, uh, channel. Uh, secondly, uh, the incre uh, incremental ability uh, of uh, this funding is difficult to ensure. So this issue alone uh, uh, makes the international climate negotiation between the developing country bloc and the advanced economy extremely bitter. Um, if you look through the eyes of those poor African country, Asian country, Latin American countries, uh, they have long been committed by advanced economy for this funding, but they haven't seen enough of them uh, after so many years. So this is really the time uh, for you to take a lead uh, to resolve uh, the ongoing dispute between advanced economy and the developing country bloc. Let's, let's, you, yes, you, yes, yes, I'm fine now. Uh, the, we've talked about government negotiations. How, what is the role do you see uh, with the private sector in, 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 in helping to push the uh, uh, adaptation mitigation? Uh, and to what extent would the private sector have a bigger voice in COP26? This is a, you know, a very, very, very broad question. But I'd like to hear both of your views. Maybe Kevin, you go first this time. Kevin, you're oh, okay. Uh, so, uh, in terms uh, of adaptation, uh, I would say we need to be a little bit careful because we still need to pay attention to mitigation first. If we focus too much attention to adaptation, this could turn out to be a climate uh, uh, nightmare in the end, because if we, every country, especially the advanced economy, uh, put uh, too much resource uh, on adaptation, uh, so how could uh, uh, the world that is short of funding to deal mitigation issues uh, could resolve, uh, uh, resolve the climate crisis and uh, meet the Paris Agreement goals? Uh, I think the look, private sector. I I started in and in, in, I've been the cop in all impersonation, if you want. But I started with the private sector uh, in in business, and I you know I I, I was with, with the business community, what they call the bingos, in uh, in 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 the cops. Uh, I think there was a there was a heyday of the bingos where I think. Uh, we're a little bit behind us in terms of really broad participation in, in certain ways, but in, in different ways, they've really scaled up. And what I mean by that is that we see a lot of, of companies coming up there, not being observers, but really being trying to be actors and show that they are ahead of government. Now, is this realistic? Is this, you know, what you call greenwashing? I mean, it's 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 both, and it's never it's never clear and clean. But it's quite clear that you see many many companies that are there, and they put they, they put a lot of time and effort in putting their right foot forward and showing the best face. Why? Because they think that it is a place where they can, uh, if you want, highlight. The fact that they are moving, they can move, and in a way they are being held by the restraining leash of the government. It is in in you know you see a lot of, of commitments being made, 
you see a lot of, of investment and people moving forward with investment and technologies that in the end will depend on the government continues to move in the same direction the, the, this 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 train is left the tr this train is left the station uh, and if there is a reversal or a slowdown there actually going to be a whole bunch of people at this point who are going to be punished because they have made the leap and invested a lot of money. I mean, I'm looking at a, a lot of the power companies, if you want. We're now beginning to look at a lot of the transportation companies. You know, we're, you know, we're looking at, you know, in, in, in my mind, my expectation is that 10, 15 years from now, or maybe sooner, I'm going to have to choose between an electric vehicle made in, 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 uh, in Munich or in, in, in Beijing. I think that it, that competition is going to become very, very acute. And I think companies are really uh, positioning themselves. So from that point of view, there, there's always companies that will advise a, a more orderly transition. And there is a fear for a disorderly transition, especially in the energy supply chains. You know, what we don't want to see is prices of oil going from 30 to 100. I don't think that's helpful to anybody. I think that we need a stable transition. We need a transition that uh, companies can plan and companies can have the resources to pay for the transition. I mean, it, 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 is, a, it is a big outlay. The governments will put some money down, but a lot of the funds will come from reinvestment. So companies, I think, are going to be a positive actor. And those that will not be a positive actor are going to be very unwelcome in, in, uh, in Glasgow. Uh, let me pose this question from the emerging markets. You know, when you talk about ESG, it's easier for the big multinationals to meet ESG standards. But a lot of emerging markets are finding huge problems. There are no uh, uh, agreed standards. Uh, um, the, 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 the actual transition at the grassroots level, corporate level of ESG standards and SDG standards is, 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 is a complete mess as, as I see it. Uh, you know, uh, lots of consultants coming in say, I want to advise you on this, but really they don't know because the standards are not quite there. So, uh, so in my mind, the, the private sector is having a, not enough guidance on how to prepare the projects to help either on the mitigation and on the adaptation. Is that a fair comment? Well, Andrew, it depends. You know, it depends how statist you are. And some would argue always in, in, in the transition in an economy, I'm not an economist, I want, I'm a wannabe economist, uh, but anyone in transition, you always have this, this, this tension between regulation and, and market forces. And that is a tension between the efficiency of the transition, but also the implacability of the of market forces. So the question is, you know, one of the big issues in Europe right now, which is spreading, I'm not sure how it plays in China. I'm sorry, Kevin, I just don't know. Maybe, maybe you can tell us, is this issue of financial taxonomy. And there's some people in, in the corporate sector who love it. Because bank, you know, my God, I'm gonna, I, I need, as you said, Andrew, I need somebody to tell me what the standards are. I wanna make investment and I want somebody to tell me what the standards are, what's sustainable, unsustainable. You know, where is the where, what is what qualifies as as uh, as a sustainable uh, uh, investment? On the other hand, you hear people like you know Clement Fuss, the head of I4, big think tank in in you know the economic think tank of Germany to some degree, basically saying, "Listen, guys, if you go down this route too fast, you're going to end up with a centrally planned economy." And what you're asking for, you're asking for governments, you're asking for governments to basically to take the risk away for you because they'll tell you what to invest in and you don't have a risk because you invest in what the government tells you. So I think there's a balance that needs to be kept between the two. If you break that balance it's in, in one way and there is no standards and there is no guidance, I think the guidance has to come in the form, at least where we come from and we are a fairly free market uh, think tank, guidance has to come into a clear direction of march, of walk. What is the direction of walk? 
but I think that the the uh, entrepreneurial spirit and 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 what market forces will discover in the end has brought us this level of prosperity. We see that you know you know we see how China is using markets in a in a in in a uh, in a different political system, but using market forces to allow to some degree in a very very good way. And we at in in Europe here have uh, have a fairly mixed economy. It's certainly uh, it's a much more status decentralized approach that that would be used in North America. So that's I'm not sure I'm giving you an answer, but giving you a feeling for what the thinking is and what people are watching for. No, that's useful because from the emerging markets at the moment, there is a lot of confusion at the corporate level. I've just participated in a in a in a meeting in which everybody vented frustration. They said we want to do, we want to move, but I, there, there's no guidance anywhere. Right? I'm not even talking about guidance from the government. I'm talking about the guidance from the accounting profession, right? Uh, uh, you know, the securities regulators, you know, uh, say, well, just meet them. But uh, how do you meet them? Because you know, th this is a a, a, a real issue uh, on the ground, and it's practical issues that are very very important now. How, how do you? It is. It, it is not the. I mean, it, it is totally correct because if you take if you take advanced economies with good infrastructure, good information systems, what have you, and you know, I, again, I'm not a China hand, and I'm, I I can't claim that I know it very well. But you know, somebody described it. You, you, and 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 Kevin described it that a little bit of a two-speed with a very, very advanced and very well-to-do part, and this part of it which is less, less in that in the same category. But if you look at other countries which are nowhere, I mean, you know, what you're going to do and and go and implement an emission trading system in an LDC, you know, that is a that's a real tall order. You know, I mean, it took the EU 20 years to do one and get one kind of right kind of you know it's kind of working now but the, you know you want to go into ldc and and you want to you want to tell them that they they have to export according to certain standards you know once you start putting standards on cocoa exports to europe then all of a sudden you change the nature of the cocoa industry in a developing country because you need to amalgamate so there's got to be that this is why you know also as, as a think tank and you know this is our five cent uh five second uh, uh commercial we are very concerned about transition and the impact the cross-border impact of this measure they need there needs to be a, a lot more to be done on impact assessment and a lot more needs to be dedicated to uh, ensuring that uh, the uh the changes in developing countries which are much more rapid and deep than in other countries need to be well understood and that they can be accom well accommodated may not be the right word but the countries or the economies can adapt to it and react to it because in many cases they are takers of regulation uh, thank you i think we're running out of time unfortunately because you know we have to leave at uh, uh, you know 955 um so uh, you know uh, kevin you you we lost you for a while why don't i give you the last word you know what? What are your feelings and your hopes for you know COP twenty uh, twenty six and especially U.S. China? Okay, one minute. So, in terms of uh, U.S. China relations, I personally wish this country will work on not only on climate issues, but also on many other pricing global issues, especially pandemic control. Um. Uh, even uh, climate change has been often mentioned as the, the area of stand and all issue. I do believe uh, a reasonable bilateral relationship uh, and the mutually accepted one uh, should be beneficial uh, for these two countries to collaborate uh, on these vitally important uh, issues. Uh, this uh, is my uh, personal wish uh, for uh, what will happen between these two countries during COP26. Okay, good. Uh, Andre, last words. Uh, last word is I totally agree. I would completely agree with Kevin. I think that COP26 a success without China-US cooperation is going to be a not an easy, not an easy uh, result. 
So I do hope that uh, that the, the time that the corner will turn and that we will see that cooperation going back to what we saw in Paris. Well, that's uh, well. I think we're we're literally running out of time. So uh, on that very good note, which I totally share with you, I we all realize how complex the issues are. Both of you have taught me, you know, a, a lot of detail. You know, the devil's truly in the detail in these negotiations. So thank you both for some fantastic speakers and our audience for a wonderful session. Uh, we hope we can, you know, we could talk about this all night, but I hope uh, those of you who are listening will be able to join us for the next session, uh, International Cooperation, Who Governs and Who Funds the Climate Transition uh, with Jayati Ghosh, Rohinton Medora and Keston Perry uh, starting very, very shortly. So let me end the session here. Thank you very much indeed. And we'll say goodbye uh, and good night for any of you who are in the already the evening zone. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Andre, for, 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 for joining. And thank you, Kevin. Thank you. Sorry about the connection uh, issues. Okay. There we are. Thank, thank you, you very much yeah. for helping. Bye-bye. Okay.